On this episode of Cell Block 6. Don't have to be so rough. I don't know what you say. A jailed mother leaves her young child behind. I think about my son all the time. He doesn't understand the whole situation. I don't even care if tomorrow comes. A longtime inmate gets devastating news of her son's death. I'm not letting myself believe it because I don't know how to deal with it. They're saying I'm the mastermind. A young woman awaits trial for murder. I have no idea as of right now what's going to happen to me. A repeat offender gets some tough love from her mother. I called my mom. She told me she's not getting me out this time. And fear strikes this mother to be. I am a first time mom and this is my first time in jail. This is not any place for a mother to be. Vanessa has been arrested for a DUI, a probation violation. Processed here at the Pennine County Jail. It should take about four to six hours, not too long. I did a modeling shoot Monday evening, had one drink, got a DUI, got bonded out Tuesday, went home, you know, cooked dinner with my daughter, played with her. Step into this yellow box. You're going to face the green wall. Got up this morning and then went to probation to pay more on my fine. And then my probation officer asked me if I had got any new arrests or citations, and I lied and said no. You have anything on you that can poke me, stick me, or hurt me in any way? So, here I am. So I've been to jail approximately 25 times. I've bonded out every single time. Over the years, Vanessa's charges ranged from simple traffic offenses to theft. Put your hand on the wall. This is the first time that I will not be able to bond out, and I will be here until they tell me I can go home. From here, and forward, touch the wall like a push-up. When you know that you can't go anywhere, that's the worst part for me. 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. Look at the camera. Don't blink, don't move. Hold up for about five seconds. I guess I will be a resident here. When you first get here, it's made to be uncomfortable. It's made to be in a dark, lonely, scary-looking place. Have a seat in the middle bench facing forward on top. I was extremely devastated. I mean, I have to figure out where my daughter's going to go, who's going to care for her. She's five. <sighs> she thinks I'm off helping a friend. If I didn't have a kid, I probably wouldn't even be crying. I mean, I'm sure I'd be upset. But I would just have myself to worry about. I wouldn't have my child to worry about. I left through the door. It's funny. She actually stole something, and I caught her. So I make her call back in the store, tell the lady, I stole this. I'm sorry. I apologize. I discipline, and I do all this. And then here I am in the timeout spot. And I actually drove her to here that night. And I said, this is, this is timeout. I was like, this is jail. This is where people go to steal. You know, and she was, Mommy, please, don't leave me here. You know, she was so upset. You know, she may have to come, like, actually visit me here. I have a real life outside of here, and that all comes to a halt. And all I can do is communicate through a collect call to someone is to try to get everything in order in a very short period of time. Mom, it's me. I'll try back in a second. Unable to reach someone to pay her bond, Vanessa will be held at the jail indefinitely. You're about to get showered in. You understand the procedure? You been in before? No, ma'am. Not okay. this room. Okay. Once the um, door's closed, you're going to get completely undressed. Everything goes in a brown bag. Okay, you're going to wet your hair. Soap is on the wall. It's one thing when you come in and you know, well, this is cool. I got this charge. I'm going to get a bond. I get to go home. It's not a big deal. Jumpsuit, three panties, three bras. Put all three on. New inmates are instructed to wear all clothing that is issued to them, so they do not have to carry anything back to their cell. Once showered and dressed in, Vanessa is taken to the general population. Come on. I think I've kind of numbed myself in the past 10 hours to deal and cope with what's going on. You've been arrested before, Ms. Parsons? Yes, sir. Before. DUI. DUI. It's a violation of my probation. Okay. Is that what you're here for now? Your probation violation? Yes, sir. So you've never been arrested where you went to housing? No. Vanessa heads deeper and deeper into the belly of the jail, 
a journey through a maze of hallways hundreds of yards long. To veteran inmates, this is known as the long walk. I just want to go before a judge. We got to go home to my five-year-old. Yeah, my five-year-old? Yes, sir. Daughter or son? Little girl. Little girl. Who is she with? She's with my mom. She's with your mom? I'm sure I'll break down 10 more times before I can fall asleep tonight. Thomas Central, can I have I and out of door, please? I can only cross so much. I'm just trying to keep it together at this moment. I have too much to risk. I have too much to lose. And it's not me, myself, personally. It's my child, you know? She's the one hurting. She's the one who's going without. She's the one that doesn't have her mother. <laughs> and these are the consequences. The rapid response team is called to handle a violent inmate inside a holding cell. The incident started off with RT being called out for escorting an inmate who had recently been brought back into the jail, who was a previous high-risk inmate. She demonstrated the ability to disrupt the unit. So RRT was called out to escort the inmate through the booking process. The reason there are so many deputies is because we're trained to take control, i.e. legs, arms, head, so that it diminishes the amount of damage that a person can do to themselves or to one of the deputies. Go ahead and take the cops home. She wants to act up. That's y'all wanting to act up. I ain't his Put your hands out and relax. Even though she kept telling us that she didn't want to fight, that she was tired, at any time somebody can change their mind and a flip of a switch can go from being docile and non-combative to someone that can hurt someone. We actually had to place her on the ground. Once we had complete control of her, she was placed into a housing unit with no injuries to anyone involved. And she stated, I'm done, I'm tired, I, I, I don't want to do this anymore. Coming up. I think about my son all the time. An inmate struggles with bittersweet thoughts, particularly on Mother's Day. He's six years old, he doesn't understand the whole situation. He thinks that I don't want him, that I'm leaving him because I can't handle him. Then. They're saying I'm the mastermind. A woman accused of murder begins to unravel. The weight of everything was on my shoulders. I completely broke down then. And later. I am a first time mom and this is my first time in jail. A woman eight and a half months pregnant is brought in for battery. My OB told me that, you know, it was any day now. So it makes me nervous because I don't know when it's gonna start. Unlike indirect supervision, which places bars or glass between the deputies and the inmates, Gwinnett County Jail is a direct supervision facility. The deputy is inside the housing unit with the inmates. So that deputy has an opportunity to interact constantly with inmates in that housing unit. But being with the general population has its risks. It doesn't matter if you have 144 inmates or five inmates. If they're gonna overtake you, they're gonna do it. That's why we have to have mental control rather than physical control. My job is to mingle among them and find out what's going on, if anything, and just make sure no conflicts arise. We take a proactive stance instead of a reactive stance because we usually know what's going on before it happens. Where in an indirect supervision, they take a reactive stance because typically the biggest, baddest inmate runs the housing unit or the cell area. When you have the initial officer presence, it takes away from the inmates trying to deviate to do different things. We key in on their charge as far as how serious their charges are, but also we key in on their behavior when they enter into our facility. If their behavior dictates it, then we separate those inmates from other inmates to make sure our inmates are safe. 
when you're in here with them, you learn their personalities. You know what they're gonna do before they're gonna do it. Just as they're observing you, you're observing them. The newest addition to the jail is 19-year-old Radia. I'm a student. I'm in college. My major is veterinary medicine. I'm not a criminal. I don't belong in jail. Radia was allegedly involved in a violent altercation with members of her family. I'm going to search in between your skin and your pants, okay? But she insists that they provoked her. They were antagonizing me before I even decided to leave the house. Like, you want to fight, you want to fight. I've been down to get my laptop, but she does when she kicked me, like, tried to kick me down the stairs. And when I turned around to, like, restrain her, they both started choking me. She started pulling my hair and grabbing me and trying to bite me and all kinds of crazy stuff. You're going to look right here at camera number two. Don't blink, don't move. This I finally got up and ran out the house and called the police. Radia was arrested for battery. Because a younger family member saw the incident happen, she is also charged with third-degree cruelty to a child. They said just because I'm the one caught, it, that doesn't mean that I was the one that was a victim. So I'm still the one who got arrested. It is now time for Radia to be fingerprinted. These prints, along with her permanent record, will remain with her for the rest of her life. Relax your fingers. If they do have to be fingerprinted for the offense that they committed, then we use this machine. We don't use ink anymore. It's all computerized. I'm going to roll each one of your fingers, starting with your thumb. Relax your wrist. All of those records are kept, and in the future, if they are re-fingerprinted again, we can verify people's identity. That way we can see if they're using false names, check to see if they have any active warrants. Back in her holding cell, Radia tries to call friends to bail her out. Nobody answers the phone, nobody responds. No way, no people to come, way, no people to come. Nobody came. Radia was detained for 26 hours and was released when a family member bonded her out. The next woman to arrive at the jail is putting up a hard front. I don't like to cry. I've cried too much over the last month. I'm cried out. I have to be tough in this place. Ashley is a 24-year-old mother who's been arrested before, this time for possession of marijuana. I'm religious, and I believe God caught me quick, yanked me back, watched all the people around me that I hurt, that were confident in me that I was going to do something good. And seeing the heartbreak on their face made it 10 times worse. As I was being patted down and searched for whatever, it's really degrading. Yeah, it's taken some toughness out of me. I think about my son all the time. He's six years old. He doesn't understand the whole situation. I tried to hand him over to my dad. It was very hard. He broke down. My son cried for two hours. Kids don't understand. They think that if you make a mistake, that you don't want them. Or my son said that I don't want him. He thinks I'm in here for smoking cigarettes. He thinks that I don't want him, that I'm leaving him because I can't handle him. He thinks he's bad, and that's why I don't want him. I want him more than anything, anything. Have you been in here before? Yes. I will never get to see him in, in here. Unfortunately, my mom has him right now, and she won't bring him up here. So if I'm here for a year, I won't see him. I miss him so much. I miss him every day. Because Ashley has violated her probation, she has no bond, and she is quickly processed into the general population. I'm going to go over a couple of the rules with you. Um, one of them is going to be you do not get under the covers. You cannot get under the covers at any time until the deputy calls lights out. We need to make sure they're breathing. We also need to cover uh, do not lie. That's pretty self-explanatory. If you lie, you're just making a problem more a problem. That's seriously a rule. Ashley chooses to keep her distance from other inmates as she struggles to adjust to her new surroundings. I try to stay away from everybody in here because I just 
don't like hearing about drugs all the time. I don't like hearing about violent things that other people have done. I've never been motivated to do anything before but get high, but to drink. Every other time that I've been in trouble, I've just been like, okay, I'm in jail, I'll get out. But I had something to lose this time. My son. Coming up, Ashley gets a Mother's Day surprise. Dear Mom, I want to know when you are coming home. I feel like I'm missing out on so much. Then, I've been diagnosed with disassociated personality disorder. Dealing with the emotional stress of jail. I have put in recently to see a therapist because the emotions from this is starting to get the best of me. Mother's Day. An emotional time for Gwinnett County jail inmates. When Mother's Day happens around here, you have to question whether it's something that you want to acknowledge with the female inmates, given the fact that they are not at home with their children. It was a very emotional day for many of the women in the unit. I think about my son all the time. It's stressful. It's really stressful. I feel cut off because it's expensive to make collect calls and can't talk to my son. For Ashley, the months away from her six-year-old son poses a harsh reality on Mother's Day. He thinks that I don't want him, that I'm leaving him because I think he's bad, and that's why I don't want him. I want him more than anything, anything. But today, Ashley has a Mother's Day surprise waiting for her, a letter from her son that brings out the smile that constantly eludes her. I love it. <laughs> Dear Mom, my spring break was good. I want to know when you are coming home. I have wrote something for you for Mother's Day. How are you? Doing good? I've been thinking, dreaming, and drawing about you. Love, Micah. I try to pretend like no holidays are going on. I feel like I'm missing out on so much. I love him. When a woman becomes an inmate at Gwinnett County Jail, she is given a handbook. Every jail rule and procedure is laid out in these 43 pages. Longtime inmates like Carrie have each one committed to memory. Everything we own pretty much has to stay in here. We're not really, during the day, allowed to have anything on our desk, so everything has to go in here. You're allowed to have two t-shirts, your one uniform, two pairs of socks, two undergarments. Anything more would actually cause you to get locked down. You're allowed to have two towels. These are not allowed to be taken out. You only get one set. If you lose it, you have no more. One shampoo per person, one conditioner, one deodorant, one toilet paper. There is no privacy between you and your bunkie. You gotta go to the restroom, the other one either turns their back to you or <laughs> whatever. Some rooms actually have a bed underneath that you can pull out. This room would have three people in it. It gets very, very crowded. This place is just getting hard. Carrie has been in and out of prison for the last four years for fraud and theft. Unlike many mothers here, she has fleeting memories of her two boys. My first child is 18, and my second child is 14. The last time I saw my children, 36, was when I was 32. When I went to prison, my ex-husband sent me papers, taking full custody away from my kids. He printed one of my mug shots and posted it on the wall. And every time my kids walked by, he made my kids stop to look at that and say that they never wanted to be like me. She's one of the inmates that when she came in, she needed a lot of uplifting. For Carrie, I think, being inside a cell, um, sharing a roommate, I think that was like a total shocker for her. She never really wanted to come out of her cell a lot. She spent a lot of time on her bunk. One day, I actually pulled her out of her cell and asked her to come and speak with me, and she cried. It was like a lot of depression that she was going through. You usually look forward to free time, but it's just getting to the point that you don't even care to go out for that. Some days I'm able to do my famous, you know, fake it through the day type of thing. All I can do is pray that tomorrow's gonna be better, but 
and I don't see it, you know? One of the things that we offer in the facility is we have therapeutic groups in the housing units. Oftentimes you can see the bond develop between those ladies and they really work as a support system for each other during the time that they're here. I can sit here and tell you something that did happen and it's like I'm talking about somebody else because I can't, I have a hard time relating those feelings to myself. Right? Yeah. I've actually been diagnosed with disassociated personality disorder to where these things happen to somebody else. Either I'm very, very happy or you could do the slightest thing and I'm just over the top with it. Carrie suppresses memories of her past, a past filled with physical and emotional abuse. Sometimes something will happen out at free time and it will just bring a flashback of something that happened and I can't push it away. It's just really getting to me. And then when I go to sleep, sometimes things that I didn't remember come back. When I was diagnosed with this, my therapist told me that when these things start coming to be real to me, that I was going to have a breakdown. And now that these things are coming to me, I have put in recently to see a therapist because the emotions from this is starting to get the best of me. Many people come in here and have unresolved issues where they feel very angry at their family members for things that have happened to them in the past. I wrote a letter to my brother and just needed to put out there the things that I am sorry to him about. I have so many things that I need to say to you and I don't know where to start. I sit here and wonder how you turned out to be such an amazing man and how I turned out to be such a failure. I'm really wondering if you'll ever be able to be proud of me. You have an amazing family and I've lost mine. I am so alone and it's a big slap in the face to realize that I am the reason and no one else. I have hurt my boys by my actions. Part of me is dead without them. Sometimes I feel like I'd be better off that way because I will never get to be a part of their lives. Coming up, Carrie gets tragic news that her son has died. He had been driving home and hit a tree head on. In a heartbeat, I would have gladly, you know, taken his place. Carrie's been seeing the jail therapist in an attempt to heal emotional wounds caused by the separation from her family. She finally reached out to her brother and received devastating news. He told me that my son, who was 18, had been driving home drinking and hit a tree head on. He didn't make it. He was my firstborn. I haven't been able to see him in about four years. Both of my kids are my heart. I, I'm not letting myself believe it right now because I don't know how to deal with it. I don't know how to make it through it. I mean, in a heartbeat, I would have gladly, you know, taken his place. I don't want anybody to take it the wrong way. But I don't even care if tomorrow comes. Unlike anywhere else in her life, Carrie finds support among her friends in jail. How are you dealing with losing your son? I mean... Mm. I think that the best way <clears throat> that I'm doing it right now is just by not doing it, if that makes sense. I mean, I'm afraid if I have a breakdown, you know, on it, then I'm not going to end up getting to stay in here, you know? What Carrie is referring to is Suicide Watch, an isolation unit inside the jail where inmates are sent if staff believes they are a risk. I'm dreaming all these crazy things about my son. The last one that I had, you know, he's telling me that he hates me because I wasn't there to keep the bad stuff from happening. I think if I could just scream mm -hmm. and just hit something really hard a few times. Talk about it, you gotta talk about it. You just Cry. gotta release, yeah. This is, you're dealing, you're coping. All I can see is, you know, where I messed up and I'm just not, I'm just, it, I just don't want, I don't know, it's just hard to explain, it really is. And what if you were at home and it still happened? 
there would have been no difference. If I would have been home, I could have been the one to instill in him you drinking and driving. If it was going to happen, it was going to happen. It's just easier to pretend that he's still here and... Not healthy at all. Right now you're just thinking about pretending nothing is happening. And then when you do actually get to that point where you realize it's happening, it's going to be bad. You know that you can come get me. It doesn't matter what I'm doing. I will always listen, cry with you, laugh with you. I'm just not ready for him to be gone, and I don't want him to, and I want him back, and I'll, you know, I'll do anything, and I just don't get it. Carrie's friend Lorna also feels the pain of missing her family. I'm not lacking anything except my family not being with me. Lorna was charged with kidnapping, burglary, and murder. She's been in Gwinnett County Jail for two years. As a longtime resident, she has grown comfortable with life inside. Everybody here calls me Africa because I'm from Ethiopia. Oh, my family is everything to me. I'm the oldest with two younger sisters. Friends we really didn't have because we were each other's friends. And mom and dad, with the culture thing, were very close. When this happened with me, it wasn't good. On March 25th, 2008, Lorna and her co-defendants allegedly broke into the home of an Ethiopian businessman. They beat, hogtied, and gagged him, which later resulted in his death. As to what they're saying is that of the mastermind. My first co-defendant would definitely spend the rest of his life in jail. I have no idea as of right now what's going to happen to me. All I know right now is that life is taken off of the table for me. I was at home in Atlanta when they came and I looked out of the window and I seen five, six police vest guys running up to the door. When I heard all the yelling, I came downstairs. They told me to lay down, I had guns handcuffed me, put me in the car. It was surreal. I just didn't think, you know, you think it can never happen to you. I just didn't think it was happening. I was in the holding cell for at least three days. So you didn't get no sleep. You didn't get to eat. I didn't get processed right away, so I thought that it was just their way of scaring me. Then when I get thrown into 53 watch is when it all came down. 53 is an isolation unit. It is reserved for inmates charged with violent crimes. The weight of everything was on my shoulders. I completely broke down then. Because of my charges, they felt that they needed to observe me to make sure that I don't harm myself or anybody else. So they put me on suicide watch for a week. They just threw me in there. I didn't understand it, I didn't know why. We were in getting fed through a little slot with no fork. You sleep on the floor with a mat, no blanket, no sheets, with just this big outfit that you wear as a one-piece Velcro piece. I want you to put this on, okay? It, it looks like, you know, the asylum walls, the cushions, it's a one-piece that you wear. You don't have anything on underneath. They watch you when you use the restroom. There's cameras in there. It's just, it was horrible. I was relieved to get in general population because I get to talk to other people. Don't stop looking at my hair. <laughs> one of Lorna's closest friends is Sarah. She made fun of me while we were playing cards one night. I didn't like you at first. And then just, we got real close after that. Yeah. Lorna and Sarah are collaborating on a novel. I said, well, do you want to help me? And I started running down to her, and we just both got excited, and it just... <laughs> from there. Uh, I was up writing in the window. I had a bent top, my legs all propped up in the moonlight writing last night. It was great. I went back and just added a little more detail and expanded yeah. on what she was trying to say, and it actually worked out real good. I think we got a real good start. That's a banging first chapter. <laughs> a twinge of guilt almost crept in, but it vanished as quickly as it appeared. The past two months have been a whirlwind. The night was clear and the lights from the Atlanta skyline twinkled in the distance. The singer's sweet, sultry voice made me smile to myself. Smooth operator that I am. My head fell back and I began to moan. 
Coming up, an unruly inmate gets restrained. Oh, don't have to be so rough. Do what you say. And a young inmate's mother tries to teach her a lesson. She told me she's not getting me out this time. And my mom just kept telling me that she's doing it because she does love me, and it was just hard to hear her because I could hear the pain in her voice. It's late afternoon in cell block six, and a roadblock has snared four immigrant women. These women were picked up for driving without a license. Roadblocks are basically checking, make sure there's a licensed driver and that they have insurance. That's all roadblocks are for. Okay, ladies, grab this one. Has nothing to do with immigration. A lot of people want to throw that flag, oh, you're doing this just to catch illegals. Now it's a license and insurance check. That's all it is. We can catch people that have warrants out for their arrest. They can have revoked licenses. They can have no licenses. This is our first time here, this one right here. So in those instances, they'll be taken into custody and brought to the jail. When they're brought into the jail, everybody fills out the same basic biographical information, name, date of birth, social security, where you were born. And it's in Guatemala? No. no. Everybody that comes in here that says they are born from another country gets put through the immigration process. He's a citizen of Guatemala and a citizen of Mexico. The jail has a special program called 287G to deal with people from other countries who might be illegal immigrants. We uh, find out that somebody's here illegally. We detain them process the paperwork on them, and turn them over to immigration. We start talking to them, asking where were they born, if they have any papers that allow them to be in the country. Sometimes they just tell us that, yeah, they walked across the border, they're here illegally. Also now, when they send off the fingerprints, they used to just go to the criminal side. Now it goes off to the criminal side and immigration side. So if there's other immigration warrants out on them or they've been deported before, it'll come back saying, hey, this person has been deported for and alert us that way. If they're here illegally and have an extensive criminal history, nine times out of the 10, they have their day in front of an immigration judge and then they're deported. Some of these women already know their fate. They will leave this country never to return while others provide documentation that confirms their status as U.S. citizens. Meanwhile, 19-year-old Nicole is the next detainee to arrive at the jail. It's my third time in jail. So you go left, go right, whatever direction you tell you, just go ahead. I got a fighting charge with my ex-boyfriend when I was 17. I got a possession of marijuana charge last year. This is a way more serious situation than what it's been before. Nicole failed a field sobriety test after being pulled over by police. Drugs, needles, knives, anything like that, anything you brought. If I had been of legal age, I would have been under the limit. But since I'm 19, I got arrested. I called my mom. I started crying and told her I was in jail for a DUI. And she said that I'm stuck in here. She told me she's not getting me out this time. Nicole has been charged with a DUI, possession of alcohol under the age of 21, and an open container violation. I'm a disappointment to myself, and I'm definitely a disappointment to my family, too. Especially my mom. Is your mouth? When you get patted down, it makes you feel like a criminal. It makes you feel like, almost like a loser. It's a little bit demoralizing, I'd say. I go to school full time. I work full time. I'm doing something with my life. I'm going somewhere. Okay. I just keep getting stuck in the wrong situations with the wrong people. Okay. You'll be staying right here until we call you out. We'll call your name and then we'll book you in and then fingerprint you. Okay. After that, you can bond out. Okay. 
It's weird being in a room of people that you just feel like you don't belong with at all. I don't want to cry in front of everybody. I don't know them. I feel like I don't want them to judge me because I'm crying or try to pick on me or something because I'm crying. Being in jail, it's scary. Down the hall, Nicole can hear the rapid response team overpowering an unruly inmate. The restraint chair device is used to secure an inmate that is either hurting themselves or another inmate. The restraint chair application needs to be a team of four plus one team leader that kind of supervises to make sure that the inmate is still safe and not being hurt. We restrain the hands, restrain the feet, and restrain the trunk area across the chest and the waist. Once they are subdued and handcuffed or restraint device, then that's when a nurse is safe to come in. All of that is supervised for any other possible attacks or signs of aggression. This inmate is placed in an individual holding cell. She can be left in the restraint chair for up to four hours. Let me see your hands. Back in the holding area, Nicole is being fingerprinted. You seem nervous, You're very tense. This has to be done correctly. It's very important right. that we get good prints, okay? That's a good one. It's really scary being here and not knowing when you're going to get out, what you're going to do when you get out. Nicole could spend up to 48 hours in the holding cell if she does not bond out. From there, she could end up living in the general population. I just hope I don't have to be in here for very long. Despite her repeated pleas from Nicole, her mom insists she learn her lesson and remains adamant about not bonding her out. And my mom just kept telling me that she loved me and she's not doing it because she doesn't love me. She's doing it because she does love me and it was just hard to hear her because I could hear the pain in her voice. And she told me I could call her later, but I don't know if I want to talk anymore. I mean, there's nothing to talk about. Coming up. When I cuff your hand, you place your hand on the top of your head, okay? A pregnant detainee raises additional concerns. When I first got here, I was thinking about how this was going to affect my baby girl. As far along as I am, everything that I do affects her. So along with me being in here, my baby girl is in here as well. The next detainee to arrive at Gwinnett County Jail presents a special situation. 24-year-old Trakia is pregnant. I am eight months and three weeks. Right now, she is far less concerned with being in jail than she is about protecting her unborn child. I'm nervous and I'm, you know, aggravated. I am a first-time mom and this is my first time in jail. Was hoping that she'd come early but not anymore, and I wanted to wait till I get out of here. <laughs> Trakia is charged with simple battery and disorderly conduct against her friend. What's your last name? We got in the car and we argued halfway to his job, and we got out the car and we was arguing and carrying on, and some people was driving by, and they, I guess they called the police. Why? When they came, I told them that he never hit me. I did all the hitting. So they said they just had to bring me because I hit him. Pregnant detainees receive special treatment. Usually when a visibly pregnant female comes in, um, we always handcuff them in the front. To protect her, should she fall, she would be able to use her hands. When I first got here, I was thinking about how this was going to affect my baby girl. As far along as I am, everything that I do affects her. So along with me being in here, my baby girl is in here as well. When I touch your hand, you place your hand on the top of your head, okay? I placed her on the wall and handcuffed her since she's not able to face the wall. I went ahead and had her put both of her hands on top of her head just for security purposes. The process of coming in here is awkward. Like, you know, when they're touching and feeling and show different parts, you know, to take pictures. Look at camera number two. All right, go ahead and we'll walk this way. 
Usually we try to get her through the process a lot quicker. If necessary, depending on how far along she is, we'll get her down to medical so she can be down there and observed by the medical staff instead of sitting down here for however long it takes to get them booked in. Do you have any medical problems or taking any medications right now? No. Is it your first time in here? Yes. Do you have any other issues besides being pregnant? No. With the medical exam complete, Trachea is taken to a holding cell, where she spends the next three hours waiting to post bond. Come on in here and have a seat. Being in a holding cell right now is just weird. Women hover around Trachea asking about her baby. She'll have nothing to do with it. They're talking about different criminal acts, and then they ask me questions about my situation, and I, I don't really want to talk. I just kind of give them a one-word answer and kind of hope that they leave me alone. This is not any place for a mother to be. Trakia's apparent indifference to being here comes partly from sheer exhaustion. I guess I hit my peak earlier today. You know, I flipped out and was fighting and carrying on and things like that, but look at what that got me. I shed my tears, but I don't know what else to do. After deputies discuss the situation further, they realize that it is in Trakia's best interest to release her. I came in a little bit before 1, so it's, what, about 4.30, 5 o'clock now, so I was in there about four hours. Originally, my bond was set for $2,600, but I got this paperwork saying that I was released, which means that I can't get in any more trouble or I will have to come back here. Down the hall. My baby will be about five or six months by the time I go to court for this situation that happened before she was even born. Okay. I do not want to see this building ever again, outside or inside. Never again. <laughs>